Oh dear, well, poor Sadiq Khan. Let's begin. Apparently, Sadiq Khan woke from his slumber by one of the most unexpected of surprises. A caravan chained like a loyal guard dog to his very doorstep. And of course, the plot thickens a bit with messages on it calling him the dictator of London and hinting at his underestimated resolve. And if anything, it's kind of like a political thriller, only with more campfires and marshmallows. Uh, but who could be behind this audacious act? Well, folks, it's none other than the Ulez Blade Runners, a shadow group of vigilantes determined to dismantle the greater London-wide ultra-low emission zone. But here's the thing that is bound to annoy him. Parking a caravan on the road isn't illegal, nor is letting it squat there for weeks on end. It's like discovering a legal loophole in the script of a blockbuster movie, and just when you thought the drama couldn't get any juicier, one of the group's informants claims that Mr Khan's local council had a hand in the revelation, which no doubt of course peed him off even more. Because let's face it, he's desperate to rid this wheeled menace or eyesore or whatever you want to call it, outside his house and apparently allegedly pleaded with the council to remove it as soon as possible. But unfortunately for him, bureaucracy as he more than likely sees it, meant they just couldn't whisk it away. But what's a mayor to do? Well, I'm guessing he must have done something, because unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on if you sneak Khan or not, the Blade One has actually decided to lend a helping hand at removing the caravan themselves. But hopefully that actually did get the message through to him. Either way, though, it does make me wonder if another vehicle of some sort will be placed there next week. And you know, obviously I could be wrong, but if he doesn't like this sort of style of protest, then maybe, just maybe, he might actually prefer a just stop all style protest, but the ULES kind instead, rather than the peaceful protest he actually got. Either way though, I reckon his Range Rover is laughing, even if he isn't. But anyway, the article says that he said, regrettably fostering this type of damaging politics is more important to Rishi Snack right now than harm being done to our children's lungs by air pollution or the decline forced on our economy because of the recklessness and incompetence. My objection is not to good faith debate, but to the Tories showing discord and division in a desperate attempt to distract from the mess they've made of our country. The new ULES perimeter creates the world's largest clean air zone in the world, apparently protecting millions of people from bad air quality, he said. Research published earlier this year suggests that the first ULES came into play in 2019. Harmful pollution emissions had reduced by 26% within the designated area. Well, what I'm about to tell you, my friends, is a monumental slap in the face with a wet noodle for us all. I mean, yeah, of course, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure we all had this quaint notion that when we entrusted our hard-earned money to the banks, it would be guarded like a dragon's hoard. Especially, you know, when those financial institutions have been working tirelessly, or so it seems, to lead us down the cashless garden path. But unfortunately, it appears they've been too engrossed counting their mountains of gold to do little things, you know, like, oh, I don't know, bothering to protect us from those nasty scammers. I mean, sure, OK, some might argue that we, the innocent victims of these scams, need to be more vigilant. Which, OK, might be a bit fair to say, but I mean, would they rather as well that we all attend some sort of scam prevention seminars? Where, of course, they teach us to decipher the secret handshake of notorious fraudsters. I mean, would they rather that instead? Or maybe we could go one further and start wearing tinfoil hats or wrap our wallets in bubble wrap just to keep them safe. The thing is, shouldn't banks themselves bear some of the responsibility in doing everything they can to safeguard our hard-earned money and want to bring in changes quicker to do that rather than just delaying them until they are forced to bring them in? Because apparently the proposed rules that would force banks to refund victims of fraud within a blistering quick five days. Five days! Well, I guess it's still better than nothing. It's as if the banks have generously given us a tiny window of opportunity to have our money back. Maybe, who knows, it could even be like waiting for a snail to break the sound barrier or expecting the sloth to run a marathon. Unless, of course, let's not forget the excuses. The payment systems regulator, the PSR, claims that the banking industry couldn't possibly meet the original April 2nd, 2024 deadline. I mean, of course not. You know, it's only, what, six months away? And apparently making the banks accountable for their shortcomings is just too much to ask or something, isn't it? But of course, don't worry, because apparently there is a silver lining to this cloud of bureaucratic bungling. If you ever find yourself in the unfortunate position of being scammed, the PSR's delay tactics will give you an extra six months to perfect your I told you so speech to the bank. But anyway, the article says that Rocky O'Contra, who I pronounced that right, rich director of policy and advocacy, said hundreds of millions of pounds are lost every year to bank transfer fraud and victims desperately need stronger protections in the form of mandatory reimbursement in all but exceptional cases. There is no backtracking on the PSR's proposals to create a fairer and more consistent system of app reimbursement. 
With bank transfer fraud continuing to cause misery for so many consumers, these changes can't come soon enough. While it seems the BBC has embarked on a grand quest to teach us flagship presenters the new rules of engagement. You see, it all apparently started from a tweet from Gary Lineker. And we all know that when, of course, Lineker speaks, the world of lefties listens. Or at least apparently the BBC does. And now the Beeb has unveiled a set of specific guidelines, a sort of social media commandments, if you will, for those high-profile presenters. And that is apparently when you're the face of a flagship show, you must not endorse or attack political parties, criticise UK politicians' character, or become an official spokesperson for any campaigning group. It's like they hand like scripts with a stern, thou shalt not, to their star hosts. I mean, can you just imagine presenters like the likes of Dragon's Den, Evan Davies, The One Shows, Alex Jones, and yes, the ever-tweeting Gary Lineker trying to navigate this new rule book. It's almost like they're asking a lion to become a vegetarian. It is possible, but not without a few growls of discontent. But there is more to this because the rule of impartiality isn't limited to television alone. No, it's apparently extending to the mighty arm of BBC Radio presenters as well. Greg James, Zoe Ball, Vernon Kay and Scott Mills, among others, must also walk the tightrope of neutrality. And who knows, for some of them it might be as if they were auditioning for a juggling act in a circus of political correctness. But just to be crystal clear, the BBC wants us to know that these rules, for some reason, don't apply to contributors, pundits or judges or even guest hosts, which maybe Gary Lineker might try and use that as a loophole. I'm, I'm not saying he will, but maybe he will. But, you know, I guess that's probably because they're the supporting cast who are actually allowed to, to dance on the edges of impartiality while the star presenters tiptoe the line. Well, just what was Gary Lineker's tweet, eh? Well, apparently it all began when he compared government asylum seeker policies to 1930s Germany, which I guess made Tim Davey think, oh no, and poo his pants. And who knows, might have actually led to Lineker's brief BBC suspension. But apparently John Horde, the former ITN boss turned impartiality judge, has spoken. He believes that high-profile presenters should be allowed to express their views on issues and policies, just not too loudly. Because let's face it, I'm guessing these new rules probably won't make much difference to them. But the thing is, if the BBC or TV license and want to force the public to pay the extremely outdated TV license in my opinion then everything on those channels should be impartial shouldn't it and personally I think they should go the adverts route because that way they can actually be as biased as they like and get away with it or maybe how about actually making the TV license completely optional because of course while we still have to pay the TV license to watch either the BBC or other TV channels live which to be honest I think is a bloody cheek then surely anyone on the BBC including the likes of Gary Lineker should be impartial and those rules should apply to them whether they like it or not and I'm guessing he won't like it one bit. But anyway, the Arcos says that BBC Director General Tim Davies said we all have a responsibility to treat people with civilry and respect, particularly at a time when public debate and discussion both on and offline can be so polarised. The BBC also has important commitments to both freedom of expression and impartiality, and this rightly extends to social media. I would therefore like to thank John Hoard and those who took part in this review for such thorough, clear and considered report. Clarity on how those working for the BBC use social media is not only important for them and the organisation, but also for our audiences. The new guidance which introduced new requirements for the presenters for our flagship programmes is both proportionate and fair and protects these commitments. And the BBC said that specific guidance for the flagship programmes in addition to the existing impartiality guidelines for individuals working in the news and current affairs and factual journalism production which remains the same. Well, maybe, you know, who knows? The BBC might actually relook at a few of their own decisions. Because in this video, it seems like the BBC actually helped, when, to be honest, I think they should have been asking a lot of questions instead. Yeah.